French Enlightenment is often conventionally viewed as a locus for the origins of modern secularization. But even after decades of attempts to rethink the Enlightenment, the question of exactly how it planted seeds of secularization remains surprisingly elusive. Is secularization an essential property of the Enlightenment as defined by contemporaries? Or did existing concepts of the secular find themselves redefined as an accidental outcome of the 18th century uh, process of enlightenment itself. In an effort to shed light on this question, my presentation today attempts to trace some elements of the entangled genealogy that informed this, the increasingly self-conscious members of the sect of philosophy, as their critics often referred to them, by the middle third of the 18th century. In so doing, I seek to suggest how the emergence of the enlightenment is in fact deeply entangled with earlier religiously inspired debates and theological controversies. In what follows, to the extent that I am able in such a short paper, I reveal that the expansive commerce in texts and debates, even that associated with what some prefer to think of as radical enlightenment, actually possessed religious origins. This paper then proposes, in a much more limited way, a point developed at length in my recent book, The Culture of Enlightening, Abbe Claude Yvon and the Entangled Emergence of the Enlightenment. Namely, that the secularization aptly associated with the French Enlightenment, especially in its more radical guise, might just as profitably be considered an unlikely outcome of much broader shifts within an early modern cultural revolution in theology and religious debate. Now, undoubtedly, numerous squabbles and significant disagreements divided individual French philosophes against one another. Nevertheless, by the middle decades of the 18th century, individual savants became increasingly conscious of themselves as a nascent party of philosophy united in their quest to disseminate sound morale rooted in nature, empirical reason, and the cosmopolitan pursuit of happiness for individuals in society. But their willingness to anchor human happiness and useful knowledge in the pursuit of reason was in certain respects rooted in the late 17th and early 18th century preoccupation with Prisca Theologia. Prisca Theologia, as understood by 17th century erudian polymaths, was supposedly the pure theology of humankind's original, and it was thought most natural, religion. Often studied primarily as an artifact of the late 17th century, this quest for natural theology remained of overt subtextual concern to many members of the early modern Republic of Letters until well into the 18th century, even if the specific content or identity of that pure theology differed greatly among thinkers. When considered in this light, secularization evolved organically from many early modern theological controversies. Indeed, even the most radical prescriptions for enlightening very often emerged from and entangled with a laicization of theological understanding and a deconfessionalization of religious experience that is vital as I contend in my book to the era of enlightenment itself. Now, any topic that addresses the Enlightenment immediately encounters the gaping lack of any firm consensus of what that entails. One way around this historiographical impasse is to consider the socio-cultural history of Enlightenment as an entangled process. Writing a more methodologically self-conscious histoire croisse of Enlightenment, as I've attempted to do recently, is to remain attentive to the fact that as two principal theorists of histoire croisse, Michael Werner and Benedict Zimmerman have put it, entities, persons, practices, or objects that are intertwined in history do not necessarily remain intact and identical in form by that entanglement. Instead, their interactions mutually transform one another. The separate enlightenments of the long 18th century thus created and transformed one another through time and space. They were not fully separate nor temporally static enlightenments amenable to stable taxonomies or characterizations. When viewed in this way, theological debates over the nature of faith often emerge from the sources as ironic origins of enlightenment, just as texts and debates produced by what some would call the radical enlightenment could serve, did serve as important catalysts of the reconstruction of religious belief and practice. As a more focused illustration of the entangled intellectual genealogy of secularization from sometimes religious origins, we may just as well begin with Spinoza. While the primacy of Spinoza's role in crafting a more radical materialism has certainly been exaggerated, it is impossible to deny that role that appropriations of, or even unfounded accusations of Spinozism played in the intellectual growth of materialism, naturalism, and secularization. Radical understandings of Spinoza were, for example, one important harbinger and source of the, for the young Diderot at mid-century, 
But Spinoza's interpretation of one substance materialism and of the natural order as a singular self-evolving substance had far more to do with the reformulation of theocentric notions of the cosmos than with their subversion. And in this sense, as a historian of philosophy, Premislav Good has argued, materialism was not even the primary emphasis of Spinoza's ideas. The focus of Spinoza's Tractatus Theologico Politicus was instead designed to provide a demonstration that both divine causality and the characteristics of the human mind could be embodied within the same natural order. In the Tractatus, Spinoza revealed that the absolute philosophical necessity of God's nature was the imminent cause of nature's vitality. And thus, Spinoza's numerous objections to theism did not aim at negating the deity, Good contends, but instead they, in his words, constituted an attempt to purify religion from the anthropomorphic vision of God, unquote. Insofar as Spinoza's work became a source for the radical secularization of the period, it did so ironically, in a way that belied its origins as an attempt to rehabilitate religion by the deification of the natural world, as Good put it. Spinoza's philosophical perspective, much like the whole of the Enlightenment in all of its various avatars, was thus polyvalent and pregnant with potential, both for nascent secularization and for new forms of religious experience. But Spinoza's philosophy also derived from much deeper engagement with a complex genealogy, including artifact, artifacts rather, of theological and philosophical debate rooted throughout the medieval Mediterranean. The Guide for the Perplexed, an astoundingly prescient work by the Arabic-speaking Jewish Aristotelian philosopher and medieval rabbi Moses ben Maimon or Maimonides, died in 1204, was well known not just to Spinoza, but to Leibniz, Malbranche, Newton, and Bale, thanks to a Latin edition translated from Arabic in 1629. While the influence of Maimonides was scarcely exceptional in the late 17th century, Spinoza's contention that the vitality of substance is synonymous with the divine creative life force was inspired by Maimonides' notion of the world soul, an originally middle and neo-Platonic idea translated into both Jewish and medieval Christian theological discourse, thanks to the mediation of the medieval Muslim philosopher Abu Nasir Muhammad ibn Muhammad Farabi, or just more simply Al-Farabi, who died in 950. Spinoza's notion of natural religion as accessible to all peoples based in the natural light of reason also closely resembled what Maimonides understood to be the rational basis of the so-called laws of Noah, thought by many 17th century polymaths to have contained foundational principles of both civil law and natural religion and passed down as the so-called religion of the patriarchs reflected in Genesis. As Giestrimza has noted, Maimonides was already of particular interest to both Catholic and Protestant erudition of the day because of his participation in an earlier medieval rabbinical dispute that was translated uh, into contemporary culture by Oxford and Cambridge Hebraists over how many of the commandments in the Torah reflected a long lost rationally discernible purpose. Moses ben Maimon had contributed to this debate concluding that all of the commandments had originally reflected rational motivations and must also have served a utilitarian purpose. These medieval rabbinical debates cast a long shadow over the rather pervasive notions common to nearly every 18th century enlightener, Catholic, Protestant, or philosoph, that the original religion of humanity must have been fundamentally synonymous with the law of nature, and that true religion was originally and ought to be socially cohesive and useful to the promotion of civil society. Beyond its partial roots within medieval theological conversations, commonly articulated by Muslims, Jews, and Christians alike, the Spinozan system owed much to traditions of ancient vitalistic materialism revived by Renaissance Hermeticism, Epicureanism, and Atomism after the 16th century. Vitalistic materialism, as Ann Thompson has principally defined it, was an initially subdominant motif in late 17th and early 18th century thought. Vitalistic interpretations of matter became more pronounced throughout the 18th century, shaping an increasingly common view that matter possessed an imminent and perhaps intrinsic capacity to evolve. Forms of vitalistic materialism were in many ways pervasive among the ancients, as 18th century scholars would discover, rediscover. And they persisted within the writings of many early Christian authorities, only to be reinforced by the revival of ancients during the Renaissance. Authors of clandestine texts, such as John Tolan in his Pantheisticon, or Foucault, who likely penned doutes sur la religion, proved to be important in mediating among diverse forms of vitalistic materialism by underscoring their ancient roots 
fundamental commensurability. Jesuit missionary scholars, travel literature, and other artifacts of early modern European imperialism only serve to reinforce the seeming ubiquity of this kind of materialism in so many of the cosmologies of the world's peoples. As Margaret Jacob has recently reminded us, these findings often affirmed the conclusions of those, such as Tolan, who suggested that God was merely the force or sentient energy animating the universe. In effect, therefore, the pages of numerous clandestine texts played a role in synthesizing ancient beliefs with the fruits of 17th century new natural philosophy, ongoing religious polemics, and the insights of contemporary philosophers. But many clandestine manuscripts also allow us to consider the entanglement of radical and more orthodox religious works as 18th century writers worked out the cultural, historical, and political implications of what had originally been separate, often religious controversy. So how does this discursive genealogy get us back to France? Well, as religious controversy and foreign policy conflicts reached a crescendo during the 1740s to 60s in France, the fruits of more than a half a century of clandestine manuscripts suddenly found their way into print in significant numbers and reached uh, a, a more widespread readership, sometimes as building blocks of apparently unrelated works. La Maîtrise L'Homme Machine, Diderot's Pensée Philosophique, a book that did much to excite the wrath of the Jesuits against the Encyclopédie, Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws, and Buffon's Natural History, all swiftly became available, much to the growing alarm of the Gallican Church and Bourbon monarchy. The most radical edge to the French Enlightenment was then not intrinsic to something modern or self evidently secular about its characteristic philosophical perspectives. Rather, mid-century developments allowed French readers to see and find increasingly convincing the radical implications of convergence between religious debates over rediscovering universal natural theology and the fruits of the scientific revolution. The receptivity of readers to these implications required extrinsic contingent factors, of course, the social history, the book trade, new forms of sociability, the expanding press and urban literacy, intersecting with foreign policy crises in 18th century imperialism, financial difficulties, and a wave of both religious and intellectual persecution that swept the realm between about 1750 and 70. The result was a wholesale realignment of the French Republic of Letters in favor of just one more secular style of enlightenment. Diderot's own intellectual journey and influence on the public sphere, in fact, has much to do with this redrawing of the boundaries between philosophy and theology. In a way that owes something to Spinoza, to forms of Epicureanism, and to medical vitalism in the tradition of Montpellier, Diderot's article Spinozisme and his posthumously published Elements de Physiologie ascribed vitality and sensitivity to all matter and conceived of the universe as a self-directing, self-evolving organism. Derived in part from the animism of ancient Greco-Roman cosmologies and in part from the medieval Jewish rabbinical theology of Maimonides, Spinoza and his followers had attempted to reframe basic theological notions about God. From thence, at least in part, vitalistic materialism from a variety of sources at times mediated by access to formerly clandestine texts became some of the tools available to Diderot when he sought to sculpt a more useful understanding of natural philosophy without recourse to traditional religious authority. From a certain point of view, this is indeed a process of secularization. It is also, however, and perhaps less whiggishly, an attempt of the trans, an, an example rather, of the transformation and laicization of theology. The very habit of sharply distinguishing between philosophy and theology while relegating the latter to a private sphere of faith and supra rational speculation is a consequence of the Enlightenment, not its primary cause or definitive property. It is my contention here that the globally significant language of the Enlightenment proffered by its French participants is more usefully conceived as a contingent outcome of these primarily 17th and 18th century cultural and theological transformations. It is not the defining property of something called the Enlightenment or of something called the Radical Enlightenment. D'Alembert's lengthy harangue against the persecutors of the Encyclopédie, in fact, well captures this oft-overlooked way in which mid-18th century Enlightenment transformations in France effectively disseminated a new species of theological thinking. In D'Alembert's estimation, reason was not opposed to religion. Instead, his satirical rhetoric in the 1763 forward to a new edition of his preliminary discourse to the encyclopedia, merely redefined the notion of religion itself. He writes, 
the encyclopedia is assumed to have been a society formed to destroy morality and religion. They have been reproached for having said with St. Paul that the worship we render to God must be reasonable, with Father Malbranche that the good of men is in pleasure, as if the word pleasure is to be defined only as the pleasures of the senses, and with the most respectful authors that intolerance and persecution are contrary to the spirit of Christianity. This passage unmasked the hypocrisy and self-interest of traditional religious elites by effectively compelling the reader to ponder the consonance between the work of encyclopedists and the notion of a distilled essence of Christianity understood here as virtually synonymous with deism as universally true religion. In other words, in the good company of many late 18th century philosophes and indeed with even many thoughtful Catholic and Protestant enlighteners of the time, D'Alembert contributed, continued to argue that the purest theology of humanity was at its core synonymous with purified Christianity and with the quest for sound philosophy once purged of superstition and corruption. And so to conclude, religious discourse is typically the subject of investigation only insofar as it borrowed or adapted enlightenment tropes. On the other hand, I think the enlightenment is too often studied on its own terms insofar as it encouraged people to live and experience life without constant reference to God, to quote Margaret Jacob recently. While each of these approaches has its advantages, each suffers from the tacit assumption that participants in religious and secular enlightenments were by and large alien others who borrowed from discrete intellectual toolboxes. But the secular and religious transformations of the age were mutually causative of one another and of a piece with the same process of cultural revolution already unfolding throughout the enlightenment period and beyond. As Vincenzo Ferrone phrases it, quote, the Enlightenment was perhaps first and foremost an extraordinary religious revolution. It radically changed the Western way of seeing the relationship between man and God. From the historical point of view, he continues, this was due not so much to the Enlightenment's atheistic and materialistic propaganda as to its redefinition of the image, function, and meaning of God and religion, end quote. Charlie Coleman has further noted in his own work that French mystics and materialists drew on an Analogous arguments, he writes, and at times undermined the individual's claims to active self-determination. Late 18th century culture thus engaged in a process of resacralization that valorized the imminent relations between human beings and the world. End quote. Secularization was and is, in other words, a process to which the multifaceted cultural vogue of poor enlightening, diverse human affairs, contributed and it was a process that often blossomed from within religion itself. If recent scholarship on the French Revolution and to a degree the age of Atlantic revolutions more generally is duly considered, the revolutionary period merely accelerated, diversified, globalized, and intensified ways in which individuals experience the sacred through collective action, ritual, zeal for revolutionary virtue, and rights discourse. Taking a cue from Emile Durkheim and Lynn Hunt, Blake Smith, has proclaimed the French Revolution a, quote, spiritual phenomenon, a manifestation of the sacred, the legacy of commemoration of which has become its own civic religion with religious festivals and sacred tropes. Although taking its cue from Tocqueville and Charles V. Taylor more than from Durkheim, the essays in the recent edited collection by Brian Banks and Erica Johnson amount to a very similar claim, that the global impact of the French Revolution's secularizing discourse was much more, in their words, a recalibration of the religious in the modern world rather than its death knell. These reflections on the current state of the field suggest that Enlightenment secularization is just one historically significant destination of a broader revolution in both European, with both European and global causes, one that might just as well be considered to have unfolded throughout the breadth of the 17th to 19th centuries. Secondly, one that transformed theological assumptions, religious experience, and emotional regimes, much as it did methods of science and normative assumptions of political and moral thought. Thank you.